Well, as Chip Kelly does, Chip Kelly do. The first grad transfer or transfer portal hit for the Bruins in football already. Technically not even open until December 5th. But let's talk about it on Locked On UCLA. The fun begins on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, it's Zach Anderson, the Oxheimer. This is Locked On UCLA. I'm your diehard Bruins fan and D1 play-by-play broadcaster as every Locked On UCLA episode is available wherever. Get your podcast for free and to watch on YouTube. Thanks for making it your first listen each and every day. This episode is brought to you by Sling TV. Don't miss this week's matchups between all the teams on television with the college football championship games. You can find it right there on Sling. Sling, the TV you love for a price you love. Try it today. Meanwhile, I'll ask you to try and stick with me as UCLA football gets their first bite in the transfer portal. And while this will be a, a thing that picks up more on as the the winter comes closer, if it's still technically in fall, despite the cooler evenings, the early sunsets, and the holiday season upon us, holiday season for UCLA recruiting news, Chip Kelly, it's not going to be big when it comes to signing day and everything that's fun in terms of booms from Ethan Young, the director of recruiting and personnel, when he types out booms. But we got a latest boom, and who would it be? Well, UCLA will get a dra- grad transfer under the likes from Penn, Jake Heimlicher. Looks like it says Lick, but it's Heimlicher, unless Penn doesn't know how to do a pronunciation guide. A lot of teams in college football, all, all throughout college athletics, don't know how to do pronunciation guides. But it's Jake Heimlicher, who is a good edge rusher, from the Penn Quakers, coming from the Ivy League, fitting that motto for Chip Kelly in terms of books and ball. Well, UCLA went in the portal last year, got Jake Bobo, nice degree from Duke, comes to finish his graduate studies at UCLA, boom. Now they get an edge rusher, and for UCLA, remember, they've already got Leatu Latu, they got the Murphy Twins. These are guys who can rush the quarterback, but they still are past that eligibility with the Murphys coming over from the likes of North Texas. They are redshirt sophomores, technically, and Leatu Latu is technically also a redshirt junior. So those guys can come back and even pair themselves with Heimlicher, a transfer from Penn. So UCLA could have a lot of depth, depending on the D-line. If guys stay, there could be switching around. And of course, there's still a lot of questions to be answered. Where has Bill McGovern been? And nobody's gotten a clear enough answer other than the mention of an illness, and he's missed the last month and a half plus, as we hope he's okay, but there's still been a lot of questions. Will Chip Kelly have to hire another defensive coordinator? Will it fit in the system? Is this something that's going to affect recruiting and things going forward, including the defensive schemes for the Bruins moving forward? Either way, the Bruins strike first, and they get Heimlicher, who was an absolute stud for the Penn defense this year. He is 6'4", 245, a senior, so he's turning into a grad transfer for the Bruins, which will be one of probably many, one would assume, transfers to try and help not only shore up the defense, but help fill some holes offensively for UCLA, because they will lose DTR and Charbonnet and Jake Bobo. While there are places UCLA could fill from within, the Bruins still would like to have some depth up and down the lineup if they do or do not have health in the years to follow. So for Heimlich here, what is his tale of the tape? Well, this is a guy that was a 2021 honorable mention in the Ivy League, and then all of a sudden comes back his senior year for a Penn team that had a pretty good campaign. The Ivy League, they play FCS ball, and they do not play 11 games. Almost every FCS team, except in the Ivy League, plays 11 games, one less than the FBS, and most FCS conferences play in the FCS playoffs except for the Ivy League and generally the HBCUs, which play the Celebration Bowl, which leaves the Ivy League with their 10-game regular season, slight stubbornness on their part. Penn went 8-2, and helped out by one Jake Heimlicher, who is the first true transfer commit for UCLA, announcing this late on a Tuesday evening before the end of November. He comes through with, out of Aurora, Colorado, his initial hometown, the one forced fumble, one interception, 
and he is the team leader in sacks. He has nine this season and 13 tackles for loss. That puts him across the country in terms of the FCS amongst the top 10 in sacks, leads his conference in the Ivy League in sacks by at least two and a half, is 13 tackles for loss, one of the best in the team, one of the better marks in terms of around the country at the FCS level, and be even one of the better numbers when you kind of compare slightly to the FBS level. So a good edge rusher. This year, he's had a three-sack game against, he had a two-and-a-half sack game against Brown, had three tackles for loss against Lafayette. So this is a guy who can get after it and chase down the quarterback. And mind you, he had nine sacks, 13 tackles for loss, similar like Zach Charbonnet, right? where Charbonnet only played in 10 of the 12 UCLA regular season games. Well, for Heimlicher, he's come through, he's only played 10 games and had nine sacks. So if he played that one extra game, or if he was maybe eligible to play in the postseason, play a full 12-game schedule, played every game, and he's a good edge rusher for UCLA to grab at the portal and maybe get some depth on the D-line, help bolster what's been a nice pass rush at times this year, when it's been the Murphy, one of the Murphys, or even Leatu Latu, could that bolster, or is that going to fill a hole going forward? Those guys can always change their minds, regardless of who was honored on Senior Day, who is expecting maybe to transfer and whatnot. These guys have eligibility with still the COVID year, and Heimlicher is choosing to use his coming over to UCLA because he's a first team All Ivy Leaguer this year, and very well because the Ivy League hasn't announced this yet be the defensive player of the year in the Ivy League with his leader in sacks, tackles for loss, and one of the defensive presences, one of the the lethal defensive presence in the Ivy League. So a good get from the FCS FBS. We hope that translates again. 6'4", 245 for UCLA, being that first true transfer commit to join in the 2022 football offseason heading into the spring. So we'll see what happens if he's able to come to spring practice, how it all works out. Yet UCLA comes through strikes first. And interesting enough, what's the first thing they go after? It's the defense. And a lot of the outcries over the last few years, especially maybe the end of Jim Mora, and most importantly during the Chip Kelly era, has been the defense. Improved defense, but what led the Bruins down at times this year? It's been the defense outside of what m- many might say, especially with the offense in that Arizona game. Largely, if the defense could get stops this year, the Bruins... If there is a good defense for the Bruins this year, they could be even more in a conversation for a college football playoff. Well, now the Bruins have to rebuild, and what do large parts of the Big Ten have? They have some good defenses, maybe not very good offenses, very anemic offenses, yet UCLA finds themselves on the right foot moving forward with Heimlicher there to maybe bolster the defensive line, the rush, the pass rush. As you can see how much it can affect a game for the Bruins when they got one against quarterbacks who had not been touched. Remember, Bo Nix for Oregon has hardly taken sacks. The Bruins were able to get to the quarterback just a little bit. Michael Penix Jr. couldn't do anything against Cal's offensive line against Jack Plummer, who threw for over four, who threw four touchdown passes against them. And then Caleb Williams, the Bruins just could not get him down. Those are all games, important games, where the Pac-12 has guys that could come back for a year, another two in that final year for the Bruins, expected to be in the Pac-12 upcoming. And what's going to be the difference? Well, one of the differences can be bolstering and upgrading and continuing to add depth defensively in places where they already have some bright spots, some hidden bright spots, again, in the transfer portal. All those sacks and tackles for loss for the Bruins this year largely came from guys in the transfer portal. Is this what Heimlicher is going to do? Nobody's going to tell until they hit the field and put strap the pads on get the helmets on in 2023 yet it'd still be fun to see who sticks around and who's around next year for the UCLA defense that can help give themselves a much better defense moving forward is Heimlicher the 6-4 product originally from Aurora Colorado transferring from Penn using that final year of eligibility again nine sacks lead his team lead his conference be a first team all conference member on the defense and very well could be in the running for his conference's Defensive Player of the Year, one of the best rushers, pass rushers in the FCS level here in 2022. Doing it, if you look at the other numbers across the FCS in the country, with one to two fewer games. So that's important, just as it's important to know, all right, well, what do we got with Bet Online this week? This is Championship Week. The Bruins have been let out, left out, but just know that Bet Online is your number one source for sports 
betting information, stats, news, and analysis. They got the latest odds, trends, every professional amateur league out there. Whether you hear the joking rumors from John Wilner of Chip Kelly to Stanford, where are the odds and everything? Well, BetOnline's got those. They've got podcasts in addition to help you find out those trends and odds and everything to go along with it. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Where the game starts. As we transition in this second segment of Locked On to UCLA, thanks for tuning in and making it your first listen each and every day. The Bruins, we're going to move over to basketball with Pac-12 play just around the corner with Stanford on the Thursday, first day of December, and then two days off, and then hosting Oregon. Two games one might have thought would be much tougher and very well for UCLA and Mick Cronin could be a lot tougher, right? When you play at Stanford, a road Pac-12 opener, and for the Bruins, where their two losses come this year, well, they came away from home. How can the Bruins do in their next few games away from home? Well, that's always the big thing for a big program, a blue blood, whatever you want to call it, UCLA. 5-0 and at home. That's nice. Who have they played at home? You can point to Pepperdine, Bellarmine, Norfolk State, Long Beach, Sac State. All teams that could do well, could do bad moving forward. But again, you played Illinois and Baylor on the road, and UCLA came away with losing both those games, albeit in neutral sites, and then also giving up close to 80 points to both those teams, also top 25 programs. So while Stanford may not be the dark horse with the reigning Pac-12 freshman of the year in Harrison Ingram, that month, some might think with Jared Haas at the helm over there, who has yet to make an NCAA tournament for Stanford, and with an Oregon team that's already stumbled at times this year for the Ducks, who were largely on the edge looking in when it came to the top 25 or that kind of third representative. Oregon is 3-4, and four, including a almost near blowout loss at home to UC Irvine, and then three losses to ranked teams, including Houston at home, who's the number one team in the country, a ranked UConn, who's moving up the polls, And then losing to Michigan State, both those occurring on neutral floors all over the Thanksgiving week. And then they also beat Villanova. So Oregon is a battle-tested team. Stanford, one could say a little bit of the same thing, right, going forward for a Stanford team. Both those two teams are 3-4. and And at the moment, with it being so early in the Pac-12 season, in the college basketball season, They can look like resume-killing losses were very well at the end of the season. They could be resume-boosting losses, right? You have a Pac-12 game Thursday, Pac-12 game Sunday. UCLA goes back to the non-conference stretch until after Christmas, after these three games between now and then for UCLA or two, whatever it is. You go Stanford, Oregon, and then you get Denver, Maryland, Kentucky, and UC Davis before you get to around New Year's Eve when you take on Washington State and on New Year's Day you take on Washington on the road, you get a nice little schedule to breathe, relax, figure out what your team's looking like as the Bruins have their first true road game of the season. Similar to what the football season had, right? A lot of home games early, and instead of having a Colorado cupcake in the beginning, UCLA had to go to Vegas, take on Illinois and Baylor. Then following that, UCLA gets a couple of cupcakes, at least what it looked like based on the final results, against Pepperdine, who has since folded due to the likes of uh, health and safety protocols. So you wonder if they were even completely healthy coming into Pauly. And then against Bellarmine, who Mick Cronin has always said, it's fun to play, fun to coach against them. They make you better with how you have to move the ball around to score baskets. UCLA gets Bellarmine, according to Mick Cronin, in his media availability. So they got about 26 layups. They couldn't shoot the three, and yet UCLA scored a hunt, almost 80-plus points, 81, and shot about 60% from the field, large part to passing the basketball. One of two passes that Mick Cronin says, passes you should make and passes you have to make, which includes over-dribbling the basketball into late moments in the shot clock, which he wants to avoid. Well, against Stanford, this is a team, well in a, what could be an, in a nationally televised game. Not exactly sure how rowdy the environment will be against the Cardinal, but both the Ducks and Stanford sitting there at 3-4, and four, and the first true road game for UCLA may not be the most rowdy, but it definitely is a very important game 
for the Bruins going forward. This is a Stanford team that you go up and down the line. They've got some good pieces. They've got some height. They've got a little bit of depth. And you're going to look at three guys, two guys by the name of Jones and then Harrison Ingram. It's going to go between Spencer Jones, Harrison Ingram, and Michael Jones. So you have the reigning in terms of player, freshman of the year. You have a leading score returning. And then you have a David said grad transfer, one of the first grad transfers in the history of the Stanford men's basketball program. That was their game notes, not mine. As Stanford, they've been struggling to shoot consistently. I saw them in person, and they shot a bazillion percent from the field. So I am kind of biased thinking that this could very well be a game for UCLA against a team in Stanford who shoots 28% from the three. Is it possible the Cardinal could go off? Yes. But does UCLA have one of the better defenses at forcing turnovers and getting after the opponent? Certainly they do, moving themselves forward into a very possible positive matchup against the Cardinal. Although size-wise, Stanford does have some size, some guys who can shoot the three ball well in, in case that you know they ever get hot. Stanford, in the meantime, coming off a Thanksgiving week, week tourney against Ole Miss, Florida State, and Memphis, where the Cardinal only posted over 70 points once in that week, getting under 70 against a neutral site loss in Florida, mind you, in that ESPN Invitational tourney over, I believe, in Orlando. They lost by four to Ole Miss, beat Florida State by 10 on a neutral site, and then lost by eight not even eclipsing 50 points against Memphis in a low-scoring, grinded-out duel against the Tigers of Memphis out of the AAC. So, what's Stanford going to look like? Not really sure. I've seen Stanford look good. The Bruins can't fall victim into a game in their first road game of the season. Again, that's what's truly important here for UCLA. They haven't gotten that win away from home. And after this road game against Stanford, UCLA won't have a road game for another two weeks when they take on who? None other than the Maryland ter- Terrapins. And then follow that up with three days later playing Kentucky on a neutral site, albeit in New York, which will be a very pro-Kentucky crowd as both the Bruins and Kentucky feel like that will be a very big game, which could be a resume bolstering win, not one versus two, but one of those, all right, both teams have struggled at the beginning of the season type of games. Maryland this year, they've been off to a fantastic start. Maryland is 7-0, and all they get is their Illinois, Wisconsin, Tennessee before they host UCLA in the middle of the week come the middle of December in a couple weeks' time. So UCLA will be tested, and if they can't get it done against Stanford on the road, how confident can you be for the Bruins to play against an Oregon team that's already been battle-tested, as I've mentioned, Number one, now Houston, a solid UConn squad that showed so far, and a Michigan State team that beat Kentucky on a neutral site in, I believe, double overtime, back and forth, and that was when Oscar Sheboy was playing for the Wildcats. They beat Villanova on a neutral site, and their loss at home for Oregon, yes, you can look at that UC Irvine loss, but a scrappy team, one of the better mid-majors, one could argue. And here UCLA is, that first week, of Pac-12 play, and even McCronin in that latest media availability before this game kind of mentioned, yeah, it is very strange about this Pac-12 slate, this very early one-off, and with him coming in during the odd COVID slates, those one-off games have been not played as often. They used to have the 18-game schedule. You mix and match the two games between certain programs and then the one-offs against others. UCLA get, got the Stanford-Oregon one-offs, because why not? Because those are going to be the big matchups. UCLA would have loved to have maybe the Oregon State, although Oregon State playing a little bit better as of late, and especially that Cal game would have been such an easy road game to get as your Pac-12 opener. Instead, UCLA has to find out, all right, but Cronin was kind of thinking, all right, well, we come from a game where they got 26 layups against Bellarmine, who, as he mentioned, was a gap, no paint team, throwing the ball around, moving the ball, ball movement, leading themselves to easy baskets. Can they do it against Stanford? Certainly. Just got to avoid turning over the basketball. It'll help. As he said, looks like Jalen Clark will be back from illness after he missed that Bellarmine game. So UCLA, without their biggest and best defensive weapon, a guy who's actually been a nice key scoring guard on the outside for the Bruins and also slashing to the rim, 
a sneaky three-point weapon as he's having a career high in terms of three-point percentage in field goal takes and makes, at least so far early in this season for Jalen Clark. will be nice to get him back against a Stanford team that has some three-point shooters, has a little bit of has a bit of size, to be quite honest, a couple of seven-footers, 6'10 guys. Maxime Reynaud, a guy who can hit it from deep. They got some guys who can stretch the floor, but they're not hitting it. Then Stanford could be an easy win. What's important for UCLA is they take care of business on the road and then take care of Oregon, which we'll kind of pregame and detail that one a little closer after the, the UCLA-Stanford game and into the weekend before they take on Oregon. But still, the important is the importance is, hey, it, it's clear Arizona is one of the top few teams, top three, four teams in the country. Is UCLA in that same class or are they – just a notch below, and we won't know for a little bit, won't know for a couple weeks before they get these first couple of Pac-12 games out and then get Maryland on the road and another big test against Kentucky because they won't play Arizona until the start of the new calendar year. But UCLA, they have their chance to start off on the right foot and get it done against Stanford. You'll get my pregame keys and more in-depth in the next Locked On UCLA episode. We'll get to in-depth keys and a matchup to watch against the Cardinal, yet here UCLA is one, got to start off on the right foot against Stanford. You have to, and then sweep it against Oregon. Easier said than done against teams that have porous records now, but those records could look completely different come the spring. One would think Oregon's record wouldn't look the same as it does right now when it gets to March, and we've seen them before do it under Dana Altman. Go forward, win those games, get into the tournament, and have a sneaky Sweet 16 Elite Eight run with the team that wasn't expected, at least with the record at the end of the year, to even make the tournament. Stanford, well, that's a team that's tough to beat on the road. And when it's Stanford UCLA, you know, it's not the same as when they had the Lopez twins there, but it is a little bit different when they've got some guys who can score the basketball on any given night. If the Bruins don't shoot well and Stanford gets hot, like I've even seen them do in person, well, you could be on the ropes in your first true road game of the year. You have to win those Stanford games to prepare for those rowdy road environments, whether it, be as, whether it is in Oregon at some point later in the season, as it will be in Tucson later in the year at USC. These are the games that prepare you for resume building wins for those games in March, for the Pac-12 tournament, and eventually the NCAA tournament, which the freshmen have to grow to learn how to play in those, just like the veterans with the Tigers, the Jaime Hawkeses, the Jalen Clarks, David Singletons, all those guys know how to do going forward with their couple few years experience now as senior leaders, junior leaders coming into this one. UCLA stand for just around the corner. Pac-12 play is already here just as the football regular season wraps up. We'll get to bowl game scenarios throughout the week, pregame predictions and thoughts about UCLA Stanford and more as UCLA women almost knocked off the likes of South Carolina. Go check out the previous episode if you want that most recent immediate reaction following the UCLA South Carolina women's game for locked on UCLA. Go check out locked on sports today. Make that your second listen. Thanks for making locked on UCLA. Your first listen each and every day. It's free wherever you get your podcast and it's available on YouTube. Get your hands in the air. Bruins fans. We got a special guest coming up. He goes by the name of cousin Eddie, uh, you know, for me, at least for me, at least you might want to get those towels ready in the air. Will it be a recurring guest? Just get ready for that guest who's going to be coming up in show in the next show, if not future shows for Locked On UCLA. It might be tomorrow, might be in the next show after that. Just be on the lookout for a you know UCLA Hall of Famer joining the podcast. In the meantime, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A UCLA fight, fight, fights. Zach Gators and Oxheimer signing off. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.